All right. So let's start with your prior to college sport experience. I saw that you went D1 Mm -hmm. track and field. What events were you running leading up to getting recruited? And then when you went to New Hampshire, what was it that got you to that point? Yeah. I mean, I think prior to even going to college, I was a multi-sport athlete, which I think is really um, what led me to actually be successful as a collegiate athlete. So, you know, I was playing elite soccer, select soccer as a youth, um, high level basketball, AAU basketball, um, and also track and field. I started very early and then I started cross country later on. Um, when I moved to Maine, I kind of started specializing. I moved to Maine when I was 14 from outside of Missouri. Uh, so just the resources and what was around me in terms of high level sport was very different. Um, I went from like a big city with lots of resources to a very small town in Maine. Um, so I then focused on running and basketball um, throughout high school and cross country. Um, I would do every fall, basketball in the winter. And then in track, I was kind of from the four by four, four by eight, 1500 meters, uh, you know, to the, two, the 3200 in high school. Um, and then decided because I wanted to go division one, um, that I would pursue running, uh, versus basketball and kind of doing both that option. Uh, New Hampshire was a really great fit. Um, I felt I could, pretty much like grow within me and reach the goals that I had. I want to be a successful collegiate athlete as well. And so it was a much smaller space, uh, three and a half hours from my hometown. Um, and I could really thrive there. And looking back, I talk about the recruiting process. It was very different back when I was (laughs) going through recruiting. And then 18, I think, I don't know if I, I would have maybe navigated a little bit differently and explored my options if I was in the current recruiting process now and, and maybe gone to a different, different process, knowing, knowing what I know now, but, um, I was very fortunate. I loved the team. I loved the coach. Everything was great. Um, and so when I went to New Hampshire, we ran, uh, ran cross country. I ran indoor track for the first time, which was a crazy adjustment because as a collegiate runner, a distance runner, you're running year round. You compete in the fall, the weekends, you compete in the winter, and then you compete in the spring In the spring, like outdoor track was my specialty. Steeplechase was what I thrived in and where I was a conference medalist, um, and, and really, took that on and and had different training modalities where when we first started, I would train much more like a, a distance runner, 5k, 10k. And then as I got better and stronger, I then switched to much more 800, 1500 runner to get the speed up to then be better at steeplechase. Yeah. When you were looking at New Hampshire, were you always looking at the, the human body movement portion of potentially your future? I mean, was that always a a determining factor of where you went? Uh, I knew what I wanted to do educationally. That was not an issue. I, at the time, you know, I didn't know the field about sports psychology and then avenues to take. So athletic training was like, oh, that's what I'll take. Right. Like they're like, you know, the hairdressers of like athletes, they get to know everything and then they know the body. And I thought that was cool. Um, And then I actually found the best avenue (laughs) to do my training once my first semester. And um, no, you know, I, I didn't think, I had a crappy recruiting process. Like I, um, I turned down really good programs like Brown. I was like, Oh no, this is like a tragic story. Like this is my naive 18 year old brain. Um, I remember when I was like 15, I ran a race, um, at Brown and it was like dark and dungy and just the course wasn't great. And one of my competitors from the state of Maine was going to Brown. And I was like, well, I'm not going to go compete with her and be her teammate. <laughs> like, you know, we were in this competitive mindset, not even thinking educationally, like, like what it could do for me. I just had a bad course experience and was like, nope. Um, I just, I really liked the coach. Um, and I think that's what sold me at New Hampshire um, more than anything. Like he was very personal. He came to meet me a couple of times. Like it felt safe and it felt like a place that I could just grow. And that's what it came down to. When you're looking at entering into any kind of college sport experience, from a recruiting perspective, what things should youth athletes be looking for from pitches from coaches? Yeah, you know, I tell I tell I've, the talked, athletes I've talked to a lot of a lot of athletes who were misled by recruiting processes. Uh, yes. Like what are some, what are some red flags that you could look for? And I, and I fear it's even more now, right. With NIL money and what that comes into and what they could false promise, which is really problematic. Um, you know, at first I tell a lot of the athletes, you are the one interviewing these schools. 
they're not interviewing you. You have a talent, you have a level, you will find a space to go to if you want to put yourself in that position to train and compete at the next level. Um, so for me, it's much more like, where can you see yourself living and being away from home? Like, that's the first one. As a human, like, can you be away from home and feel safe and feel like you could be comfortable and grow into that and navigate just the area of where you're living, first and foremost? Um, because we never know if an injury could take us out, what could end our sport career. So you have to make sure that you can be in an environment where you know you'll thrive outside of sport. Like sports, the bonus, that's the icing on the cake, right? So for, for that, I, I tell my athletes that second of all, I look at like what's important for them, right? In terms of a community that they're looking for, in terms of education, proximity away from home. Like these are all things that I like have them look into. And then when they get into those factors and narrowed on their list, I'll then say, okay, you got your education, you know, you can study, you got a place you can live, you're, you figure out how you can survive in this community. Now let's look at the team. Like does winning matter? Does being a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? Like what's important to you from coaching dynamic, coaching style, the teammates, um, every athlete's different, right? If you're an individual based athlete like myself in track, you can take ownership of your training. You can take ownership of how good you get. You're kind of beating yourself against the clock and things. But if you're on basketball or football or these team sports, what is the role clarity? What is the positions you can get? Like, will you actually get to play? Like, is redshirting going to be a part of the process? Like, these are things they'll have to go in knowing. And this is the hardest part for every athlete. Any recruited athlete is going in being the best in their area, in their town, in their state, in their region. And so going into campus, you're against everyone else that was the best. Most people aren't used to failing. And so I have to kind of like humble them a little bit, be like, hey, are you prepared to go in? and not play. This will be the hardest time for you right now. The hardest adjustment of your life, because you're away from family, you're in a new academic environment, you're in charge of your own schedule, you're overworking out with all the things, and you don't get to play. Are you prepared for that? And so those are like real, like, they're like, well, it's going to be fine. I'm like, but is, you're going to call me in October and be like, this is really terrible. And I'm sad. And I'm like anxious. And like, what do I do? And so, I mean, I think it's a lot bigger than just the price tag or what they could offer you or like sell these championships, which is what programs do, right? They're trying to get the best talent because it's a business. Sport is a business and college sports is now a bigger business. Yeah. I mean, I feel like in the age of NIL, I I do a fair amount of, of episodes with coaches talking mm -hmm. about things like coaching philosophy, um, team culture. Um, and Everyone has mentioned NIL and the impact that it has on not only not only recruiting, but team culture, because now these athletes aren't necessarily going to schools with incredible welcoming team culture. They're going for for sponsorships, for brand deals, for their personal brand, as opposed to the brand of the team. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear coaches talk about the impact of of that shift. I mean, do you see that from a from a sports psych perspective? Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I work with some universities and work with coaches and, you know, to, I mean, I work with a pretty high level coach and he's like, yeah, I've been on all these NIL meetings. I'm like, well, that's taken away from like our culture Wednesdays we're trying to build. Um, and I think the difference is you have to own the growth of what's happening in collegiate sport and say, okay, this is a part of this. How do we make this a part of our culture now? How do we make this a betterment for all of us, all our teams, our players, you know, and so how can a player who's high leverage, who's going to make a lot of money, give back to the community if we care about the community how can they give back to the team how can it be multiple team members doing nil stuff to represent the brand and continue the message that there will always be people that are trying to make it more personal for themselves and build their independent name on the back of their shirt make their stuff but i think if you own nil is here and we have a team option to be this is what we believe in as a team and how we can go promote our team with money that we receive or and maybe individually, you also can do this, right? It's an and versus an or, and you don't battle it, but then you also say there's a time to fund things. There's a time for sponsorship and there's a time for training and competing and like being a part of our team. And that part I think is growth if you can own that. Yeah. When you were going through your athletic experience in college, what kind of resources psychologically did, did your program provide? And were there any uh none and this is the irony because I was going to school to be a sports psychologist <laughs> and um I, I say that jokingly so the 
he was the um the men's coordinator and program of the track and field and, and cross country program for years. And he was my saving grace, right? He was not my coach. He had no direct training over me. Um, he was his office was opposite of my head coach. And I would go in and I would have coffee with him every week. Like Tuesday or Friday, we'd walk across. We had this place called a dairy bar, which is like this little coffee shop across from the athletic department. We'd grab coffee, we'd walk back, we'd hang out. Um, and I remember those conversations just as a human, as what my goals were, as the believability, like really saved me from a lot of disordered thinking and, you know, the pressures I put on myself. And then he did give me a book probably going into my junior year. And he basically just, he, you know, he gave me this mantra of like, you know, at the end of the day, you get to be on two buses, the bus that made it or the what if bus. And either way, the bus is going to the destination, you know, at the end of it, you're going to graduate from here, you're going to be done. Which bus do you want to get on? And, you know, and I use that now in my practice to a lot of my athletes. I have buses I give them, right? And it is, it's a great analogy, but it, it made me realize like I'm in control of this. Like he's not wrong. Like anything that I want to have happen, like it is up to me to make that happen and let me be smart about it. And um, so I got a book and I got that quote and, um, and that's what I did. Right. And, and, you know, and I think I'm fortunate compared to other student athletes. Like I was studying this stuff as well. And sometimes that's your own detriment, right? You're learning things, you're trying to practice it yourself. Um, but I didn't have the resources available. And I actually went to my master's program to further my degree. And I still had eligibility in the spring. So I ran track at a different division one program at Miami of Ohio, um, where they're even more advanced in the resources. And I was doing applied mental skills training with other teams, <laughs> you know, my second year of my program, um, and even as a student athlete there, like I didn't have anyone for myself. Um, it wasn't as ad advantageous as it is now where schools are trying to bring people in and trying to have it more regularly as a resource. But, you know, when I went through my programs there, there was nothing. Yeah, I think it's interesting when I talk to sports psychologists who are removed from their their college careers, I always ask them just kind of jokingly because I know what the answer is like why what support did you have when you were playing and the answer is really very little if anything I mean I've heard of athletic trainers giving mental health talks I mean it's it's support but it's misplaced yeah. and so it's important for people like you to come up through a system of of need and become that person yeah, and it's a battle still to this day. As, as advanced as the field is trying to grow, and and you can see in pop culture with shows like Ted Lasso that are promoting sports psychologists on it now, and like looking at trying to make it real, like it's still an everyday battle to get in the door, to get the frequency of of supporting this resource, um, and still selling the reason why it's essential and why it's important. And um, and I hope at some point, like the career doesn't have to do that. And it just becomes regular, like nurses, athletic trainers, or someone you hire, right? Like right now it's still a lot of selling. When you work with student athletes, what kind of prior mental health experience do they have? I mean, have they seen therapists? Are you like the first, the first impactful individual doing this kind of work for them? Um, you know, I think there's more people that I've seen therapists and especially with the things that happened with COVID and the pandemic and the loss of sport for a lot of them, you know, when we look at our collegiate students now, like that was at their high school or at eighth grade year, right? Like very identity formation for them. They were probably going through a lot of stuff. They might've utilized resources then. Um, generally speaking though, I'm probably in their mind, it's their last resort. They need to try something. So they're going to go see someone now. Um, and I think, if that's not the case, they've tried a counseling center on campus and they've realized that's not the fit for them. They need someone who understands sport. And so my duly training on clinical psychology and sport performance allows them to know, hey, this is relatable. You get my competitive mind and you know that I'm also maybe anxious or depressed or just not maybe fully symptomatic for a diagnosis, but on the edge of more than um, things aren't okay. Yeah, I I was talking to an athlete yesterday actually and we were we were talking about the difference between recognizing clinical issues within yourself versus performance based issues. Mm -hmm. And it's not as easy as going to a school counselor and parsing right. that out. Yeah. And I think, you know, is it situational? Is it what I always ask is this impacting you beyond the field of play? right? If it's impacting you in life. And after, oftentimes 
Yes, their sports, their identity. As much as we try to say sports, what you do is not who you are. Like every athlete's like, yeah, but I'm an athlete. <laughs> like, have you met me? Like, this is my identity. It's who I am. It's, it is the things that I do, but I also take pride in that. And so it's very hard to separate performance struggles and things that impact performance from actually what is impacting your self-worth. Yeah. When we look at the impact of support staff of on athletic mindset, athlete mental health, who is the most important piece of that support staff to facilitate positive mental health? The first and foremost is any sports science athletic trainer, like physical therapist, athletic trainer, but the athletic trainer is the go-to person that is in-house. And so they are the ones that are treating the body and the way that mental health, mental illness sits within us is always somatic. It's always physical, right? So it can lead to injury or it can be impacting recovery from that process, um, impacts our sleep. So they're the ones that are there every day that will notice a change in the body, the movement, what's happening and can get deep to it first as the first mental health responder, you know, and so their training is really important. They, they, I want and encourage them to always do a mental and emotional assessment while they're doing their physical assessment on their players um, and then provide the resources, not for them to treat it, but for them to check in, to be a safe place for them to understand what's going on and then say, Hey, this is beyond what I can help you here, but here's someone else who's going to work with me. I was listening to you interviewed on another podcast and you were talking about physical body metrics that would signify that something mental was happening. Mm, Give me some examples. Give me some (laughs) examples of that. Um, I mean, I think like anxiety sits within the gut for sure, right? Physical, physical stuff in your gut. If you're having diarrhea, if you're having constipation, if you're having bloated, like something might be going on. The first thing, anytime you have gut issues, whether it's constipation or, you know, frequent diarrhea, like you might be like, oh, I'm eating something wrong. I'm not getting the right protein intake. Like we think it's something that we're not putting in our body. And then it's like, well, we don't maybe have a food sensitivity. It actually might be psychological. Like what's the stress that's going on within you? Like what change have you had happen? Um, The other component um, is like the tightness we hold in our body. So oftentimes athletes like to get flushed from their trainers and they get stretched. And on one key indicator, like, are you tight in areas that you're normally not? Are you holding tension in your body that you're unaware of? Um, Are we compensating because we're fear when we're returning to play, we have an ACL injury, maybe we're utilizing one leg more than the other and we're compensating. And so you can see these physical markers as just warning signs of, Hey, what's going on with you emotionally? Like, where are you, where are you at with this? You know? Um, how is your sleep? What was changing, you know, like dehydration wise, like your body tells you what's going on. We can, most of us carry our emotions on our face and in our body without us realizing it. And it's a key indicator to check in and do body scans all the time to say, Hey, like, how am I doing actually? What is your favorite sports psych modality that would signify that something is wrong? Uh, what do you mean on a modality? Like, like when you're working with an athlete who may have some kind of pent up anxiety or, um, something physiologically kind of askew, what are you looking for? I mean, is there one, is there one modality that helps bring that to the surface? In terms of how I do my work with them? Yeah. Um, I mean, oftentimes I would say I'm very about like emotional regulation as a core thing of like, feel your feelings. Right. And if they're not going to talk about it, meditation and mindfulness practice or yoga are two areas physically, somatically that you can tune into your body and utilize and that I encourage all the time to say, Hey, let's just do some deep breathing, some body scans. Like, how are you feeling? Are you feeling different when you first came in? Um, and utilizing yoga and breath work as well. I've been starting to integrate that more with my athletes and where I guide it with them and we can feel where they've held their tension in their body. And, and those are two physical somatic markers that we can work through as an intervention I would do with my athletes. Yeah. PMR is my favorite. I think that oh, yeah. it, it targets so, so well, exactly where you need it to be. Yeah. Well, and I think that that is, um, you know, that would be a part of my meditation mindfulness, depending on what time they are. Like I'm very specific when I do PMR, right. Of you know, you don't want to cause tension in the body prior to working out. So it has to be like, when's the right time for them to do it. I've created, um, tons of like audio scripts for them that they can listen to on their own. So I have like an eight minute PMR that I'm like, Hey, listen to this, utilize this, you know, scan through that process. And, um, 
yeah, half the time people aren't even realizing like, wow, I didn't realize like my neck was so tight or my calves were so tight. Like, why are my calves tight? And it's like, well, yeah, you're just carrying tension in there, you know? When you're approached by an athlete to create a script, like an imagery script, for example, Mm -hmm. what are you feeding off of? Like, what kind of energy are you feeding off of from the athlete to make it successful for them versus implementing what you already know will work? Sure. Um, Well, I take them through the process first of visualizing it, experiencing and walking through it. And they have to make their own script and they have to work through and tell me it's, it's, it's no different than um, any kind of like, I'm I'm trained in um, TFCBT, which is trauma focused CBT, where you do like a trauma narrative in the same essence. um, I'm creating this like visual script with their narrative of like, what do things look like? What do they feel like? How do you want the energy? What's the pace? Um, And then I'll talk to them through when I'm making the script of like, okay, do you want to record it? Do you want me to record it? Do we want music or no music? at what, what's the emotional feeling you want to have? When are you going to listen to it? Right. So that's a very key point. Like, are you going to visualize two nights before the night before 30 minutes before each script would be very different based on the utilization of that. And I I think these are the key questions you you really have to dive in and make it person centric with the athlete of what they want. Um, but first, I have to make sure they know how to do it <laughs> and and can actually see it. And and there's two types. Like, are you a first person visualization? Are you a third person? When's it more useful? Like, how do we navigate it? Is it for skill building or is it for like game preparation and and inspirational motivation for them? When you have athletes approach you that need assistance. Are they mostly on the clinical side or are they mostly on the performance side? It's a continuum. And that's, that's my selling point is I work on a continuum of care and I treat the person within the player is kind of my mantra. Um, Oftentimes they'll come in for a sports specific struggle or they've heard it's cool to have a sports psychologist and they want to see how to optimize something, right? It's catchy or a parent's like, Hey, I really want you to talk about this, like feeling stuff with my kid, but they're a basketball player. And I think I can get them in if they're like, selling sport to them and so I'm like yeah that's that's cool sports fun um but it always ends up because I don't have to choose what I work on I get to work on the continuum that like we always go into life stuff like I I truly believe and I get in this debate a lot with coaches do happy athletes lead to championships or do does winning lead to happy athletes and which side are you on? And I'm on the side of, I'm going to make sure these athletes are happy and functioning because they will perform better. <laughs> and, you know, my coach is like, no, if we win, then they'll be happy. I'm like, okay. So, um, you know, I think most often my, my athletes might not be fully on a clinical diagnosis, but there's always something going on emotionally with them. Yeah. How much, say do you do you give a coach when you're evaluating a team culture and potentially a breakdown in in that process how much are you letting the coach lead that that kind of dialogue versus his or her athletes in terms of like the cultural assessment of the organization the team yeah yeah um, yeah, I think in, in order for me to get a pulse of the organization, like I've talked to everyone involved with it, but when it comes to implementation and change, it's got to be from the coach. Um, you know, the, the players will be a part of it, right? They'll know what's going on, but you know, the, the coach in a sense is the heartbeat of this. Like they, they do have to be the foundation and they have to kind of work through that and, and kind of keep setting the tone. And the coaches are the ones who actually have to model this behavior every day. And if, if they're not, the players will not buy in and they will rebel. But as a coach is living by the words that are written on the wall and doing those things, things, then players will be all in for that. What was your first experience with negative coaching? Oh God. Uh, Maybe when I was like nine. Yeah. Like my first sport experience, like as much as I adored my track and field coach, like I'll never forget. I was actually eight. This, this is a traumatic memory in my brain. I was eight years old and I went on a family trip in the summer, like you're supposed to, you know, go with your family. Cool. I, uh, so I was living in Missouri at the time and I went to Maryland, went out, saw my aunts and uncles and had a great time. And when I came back, um, I had lost my spot in the relay team on, at, at that point it was a four by four. And I was like, what, why am I not running the four by four this weekend? And he's like, well, you lost your spot. Cause you went out of town. I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like what's my family. Like my family took a vacation. Like I did, I'm not missing a track meet. I just missed like the week of training. Right. And he's like, nope, if you want to earn your spot, you're going to have to race the person who I gave in front of the entire track. Now my track team was like from four-year-olds to 18 year olds. And we would always have to sit at the start of like our practice for a team meeting. Then we would break into our age groups and go do our practice. 
And he's like, if you want to earn your spot back, you'll have to race a four by four. You'll have to do a 400 meters against the person I replaced you with in front of all of us. Are you prepared to do that? And I was like, what am I going to do that? He's like, now I'm eight, I'm eight. And I'm like crying. And my parents aren't at my practice. Like, <laughs> you know, and the irony is my coach actually took me to practice. Like I was really close to my coach. So I was like, okay. And I do this four by four, this 400 meter relay, this 400 rate, like 400 race in front of everyone with this poor girl. She didn't, it's not her fault either. And we have to race each other to earn my spot back. And it was like horrific. I was, I was embarrassed and I was scared. And I was like, didn't understand the logistics of why. And then I was mad at my parents for taking me on vacation. And then I swore to them I'd never go on another vacation because I didn't want to lose my like track spot. It was awful. It was awful. And I was eight. I was eight years old. Do you think that, I feel like I talk a lot about early specialization. Mm-hmm. Do you find that toxic coaching behaviors run rampant in that environment well I did a whole TED talk on the toxic culture of sport so um yes I think I think I think there is a lot of toxic culture for sure and I think it's without coaches realizing that they're being toxic they no coach I think has any ill will or any ill intention to harm the athletes that they're coaching I truly believe, and I and maybe it's because I'm an optimist and I want to believe in the good in people. I do believe that these coaches, some of them are voluntary, volunteer coaches, right? They've never had any training in coaching and they're volunteering their time because they want to be their kid. And winning consumes humans. Winning becomes this like pride and this like status and the end all be all for people without them. It's like an addictive drug in a weird way, right? So it changes our, our brain function. I really believe that the environment in itself, it sucks losing. And so these coaches get caught up in all the things and they forget about the humanity of these athletes and the toxicity rises and we reinforce it. We enable it to exist. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, it's interesting when you look at, at coaching abuse in youth athletics and especially those that peak earlier early sports specialization in gymnastics. I mean, we know what happened with Team USA. Um, I mean, it happens forever in swimming. It's insane. And swimming as well. And how do we, how do we as bystanders, as those who, who are spectators of the sport, but also who work in sport, cut this off at the knees? I mean, how do we uh-huh. say this is not acceptable for our children, for the future of, of sport. Yeah, I think twofold. It toxic culture and toxic coaching doesn't just exist in early specialization. It's probably um, more heightened for sure because of the the increased demands of these athletes and the impressionable nature of those that are specializing, how young they are, and what they're trying to work for, and in gymnastics when you can age out and what you're going through, you know, for putting your body through and the hours and demands of that sport. Um, at the pro level, uh, at the collegiate level, toxic coaching for sure exists as well, different different ways, right? Um, and and I think if we're looking at youth specifically, parents are not educated enough on what to ask, what coaching environment to look for, what oftentimes, like I'm a parent of four kids and when I'm trying to find my own like team leagues and where to put my kids in, like it's hard. It's hard to find where to go to, what are you supposed to do? Do you have your community to help you for like carpooling. And so I think there's a lot that goes into this. And and the reality is we lack coaching education and coaching standards, especially at the recreation level. That is the grassroot level to begin into sport phase. We are causing so much harm there without realizing it. Bad, it's like bad training modalities, right? We're training them wrong physically, mentally, and emotionally. Then when they advance, because they happen to succeed and be good and get to a higher select level of pay to play, the pressure's on them new coaches again, no sanctions or standards on the education with a, with a few exceptions of soccer, right? Soccer requires at least licensing to be able to coach. Um, we don't require it. And so therefore anybody can do it. And nobody knows if they were a bad coach before, if they got fired, there's no track record that you look at to say, Hey, who'd you coach before? How long have you been coaching? And I think until we can actually create a standard around coach education, coach requirements for who's coaching our children, um, we'll never be able to stop it. And we don't, we don't actually report it. We do not see it as abuse. We're bracketed morality that exists that we allow 
coaches to speak to our kids in ways that we would never allow anyone else to speak to. And I say this all the time. Like if your teachers were speaking to you that way, you'd be right up at the school. You'd be the school principal. You'd be trying to get them fired. <laughs> like, you know, but there is something about sport that we just allow it to happen. We watch a coach yell at little Susie. And you're like, well, Susie's not my kid. And poor Susie's like crying her eyes out. And you're like, oh, but Susie's the coach's kid. It's okay. He can talk to her that way no no he can't <laughs> like it's not like it's public displayed behavior like the fighting that occurs the arguing like there's so many things that we could get to beyond just actual their coaching physical practices they're just not trained they're not they're not trained and they're not held accountable these <laughs> when you're looking at that select few group that does matriculate up to elite athletics i mean we're talking collegiate and above do you think that do you talk to a lot of the, that demographic of athletes that hasn't had a good coach until college well I wouldn't even know if they've had great coaches in college if we're being exact it, it looks different in college and I say that with the kindness of my heart I, lo I love sport <laughs> I love coaches I, I do I do I love it um so those athletes that are resilient enough and driven enough and have the resources to, and the talent to get to the collegiate level and play, it becomes a different dynamic. Like we spoke about earlier in the recruiting process where you are more isolated, you are more independent, you are more responsible for your own physical, mental, and emotional well-being to get an opportunity. And that's all it is. It's you've made it to this level because we believe your ability is good enough right? But if you're going to be great and you're going to excel and thrive in that environment, it is up to you individually. And you have to hope there's an opportunity that this coach will see you and, and like you to put you in to do it, right? To serve a role. And it's very isolated at the collegiate level, even if you're on a team, because everyone is competing against someone else to get this spot, to get this attention, to be good enough, to be strong enough, to be fast enough. And there is never enough. And that becomes very hard for my collegiate athletes. Yeah. I hate I don't like talking to athletes about toxic coaching behavior because it feels a bit vulnerable to, mm -hmm. to ask a collegiate athlete, well, why'd you transfer? Or like, what was happening within your program that made you want to leave? Because then it it just seems kind of too, too intrusive of a process of an interview question. But it is interesting when I do get an answer similar to that line of questioning because they're always like I didn't want to even ask for help because I didn't know who I could trust well they don't know how and they didn't know that they need it and I think twofold when we think about why college athletes aren't either asking for help or aren't seeking out resources um, they never want to be a burden right they're just trying to do enough um, also you have to look at like the identity a lot of athletes are are playing to please. They start out playing to please for their parents. They're playing to make their parents proud of them. And around 15, 16, it starts to shift to play to please your coach and have your coach notice you. And, and there is a group of individuals who can be much more for myself and go an intrinsic route and, and play for themselves. And that is like the healthy ideal structure. But there's always the back component that the coach represents a parental figure to them in some way. And so they they will never want to speak ill will. They will never want to see the bad in these coaches. Like it's hard for them because they know if they jump on board with the teammates that are talking about about the coach, because they feel very relatable and normalized. What happens the minute the coach sees them and selects them and finds them special and good enough, then, then they're torn. Right. So like there's a part of them that are always wanted to be good enough for the coach to play. And it's, it's very similar to like when, when parents are, um, you know, of children who maybe are toxic and bad and abusive and, you know, maybe divorce and things that aren't, aren't good and aren't healthy, the kid will always love their mom or dad. They're never not going to. As bad as it looks on paper, that is their parent and there's an emotional connection to them and they will always be that for them. And we have to think the same for our athletes, for these coaches, as toxic as it might be, as isolating, abusive emotionally, like neglect by ignoring them, the athlete will still stand by that culture and that team because there might be a chance that coach comes back and believes in them and they can't give it up. So when you have an athlete that finally makes that breakthrough and says, wow, I can't believe I put up with this culture for as long as I did. What's the first thing you say to them? How are you feeling? 
which is so cliche. <laughs> but like when you just said that, I was like, God, I bet they can finally breathe. I bet they're finally like ready to be free and like happy and like, yeah, how amazing. Like it's like it's kind of weird because you don't want to like praise them, like I'm so proud of you, but it's like, damn, like how are you? Like that's pretty amazing. Like, are you mad? Are you angry? Like, what's going on? Like, do we celebrate? Like, I want them to take the lead, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, we all emotionally are different, but um, in the cliche psychology way, I'll ask, how are you? <laughs> you know, like it doesn't make you feel that you just left. Um, but that's the truth. Like it, it's more of like, how are they emotionally and what do they want now? How do they want to take ownership of their life next? When we're looking at the the impact of the transfer portal on toxic coaching culture, what do you see trending right now? Yeah, and I I wonder if like some some players are they leaving because it's a toxic culture? Yes. Are some players leaving for an opportunity because they can get to play? Yeah. You know, and I think it's twofold, right? Some are realizing their current situation, their role, they're not going to get to play. Like COVID really changed the dynamics for like how long people could could stay in the system, right? It took away a lot of money. It took away like options for role clarity if players stayed on for, for another one or two years. And so I think we'll see that recalibrate in the next two years because we don't have those extended years for players. Um, but I think, you know, entering the transfer portal, sometimes it's an escape and it's avoidance of the reality of what's really hard for them. And they're just trying to like run away. Others are trying to find an opportunity. Um, and others maybe just realize like they need, they need to go back home and maybe closer. They need to have a safer environment, a smaller scale. And they've, they've had the awareness of where they're currently at. It's not good enough. It's not helping them succeed. What do you think is the main misconception about the work that you do? Hmm. How do I help anybody? (laughs) Right? Like it's, it's funny when you say that, right? Because when you think about like an illness, if you go to a medical doctor and someone has like a disease, can we treat the disease, right? Can we fix the cold? Can we repair a broken leg? How do you explain to somebody that you're repairing a mental, you know, shift in the neural functioning or their heart, the emotional component? Like, how can I track and show you my progress when you physically cannot see their pain? And it comes into trust and it comes into, you know, explaining what the impact of our work looks like. And and I do try to create metrics around that, right. To show like, and it's subjective in nature, but I try to measure the work we're doing. Um, But I think the biggest misconception is that everybody can do what I do and what work am I really doing? And how often am I really needed? Are you really need to be present all the time? You know, I think that's the conception of like, you know, I'm I'm not needed all the time for them because they can't currently see the mental and emotional injuries that these athletes have. When we talk about misconceptions of of sports psych as an industry, but also the impact of sports psychologists, how do you sell a youth sport program on needing mental health services? Yeah, and I think um, that's where we go into the preventative approach versus intervention. And, you know, I think it's it's twofold. Are we selling mental health, mental education, and or are we selling mental performance and mental skills training, right? Two different components. Um, myself, like I would kind of do both. And, and for youth, it's much more, I'm going to help educate you on these core foundations of mental skills. And I'm going to help educate you on how to speak and talk and feel your emotions so you're better prepared when things happen. And so it's an approach around, I'm not intervening with you. And I, and I do have a philosophy in my practice that I I don't work often with children under the age of 13. Um, and partly because, especially if it's sport specific only, I have an eight-year-old who wants to come to me um, for performance work as a mental skills coach and do their stuff. I'll say, what's going on? Do you have any anxiety? Do you have anything that's happening more from that, that framework? And if it's just purely performance, I'll say, you don't need me. Um, I don't need to be an extra coach in your wheelhouse. Sports supposed to be fun, go engage, do less lessons. I'll talk to the parents about it. I'll happily meet with parents for parent education. And I'll tell the parents, Hey, I'll meet with you. So you can be the best sport parent you can, but your eight-year-old doesn't need me. And if they really want someone, I'll refer them to someone who is a mental skills coach who works with kids. Um, because youth drop out of sport by the age of 13 at 70%. This statistic hasn't changed. And so I don't want to be an extra for them. Um, so I will, however, do preventative work with eight U8, U10, U12 club teams and, and teach them core foundation educational skills. So it's much more a part of their daily training. So it's not a uh, have to because Tommy's doing it and or because like, you know, they're 
they're trying to keep up with stuff. It's um, an, an intervention-based approach either. It's much more like, hey, I'm going to teach you skills so you can be better prepared as you age and progress and hopefully have a reduction in mental illness, right? You have a reduction in problems because you have the skills to kind of work through it. When you were looking at getting your CMPC certification, what was the biggest roadblock to that process? Well, I didn't have one. <laughs> um, I was very fortunate, partly because I was really trained always from my undergrad to my master's to my clinical program. I knew I wanted to be a clinical sports psychologist. Um, I knew the avenue to do that. At the time, I had to take way more courses and get way more degrees than is needed. So now we have programs that are, that are a lot more condensed, which saves people money and time. Um, but, you know, I guess if I were to explore a roadblock block and I didn't have one because I got it when I wanted to, but um, the roadblock that exists and would have existed if I wasn't um, as active and driven as I was and didn't have a great mentors who helped me, there was no internship opportunity for me to get hours. Like I had to create my own hours. And so my first year into my master's program, uh, Dr. Robin Bealey, who's been my go-to mentor for my life, uh, she believed in me enough to know that I could do this as an applied practitioner. She knew that I wanted to be an applied practitioner. She knew what I was going to do. She helped me say, hey, here's a client and they're going to be your hours. And then like I worked through and I actually created a business while I was in my master's program. I had it's terrible. Like I didn't actually know anything about running a business, but I was getting money and I was getting paid to do it. And I was like, can we do this? And she's like, it's no different than a paid internship. So with her guidance and my self drive, I started getting clients and I started working through stuff and, and created an organic internship hours. And that continued on into my, um, when I was getting my clinical degree, I just networked with people and said, Hey, like, can you be my supervisor for this while I while I build a business. Um, now programs exist where there are more internship-based opportunities, but that is the hardest avenue, I think, for any anyone in the master level or doctorate level who wants a CMPC and isn't going a clinical route. There is no actual prescribed internships that you go to. Like in the clinical field, it's a part of their training program. It's part of their systems and they can go and they get their hours, right? To then set them up for licensure. And there's a very systemic way. We have schools that are starting to do that in this mental skills realm for CMPC, but it's not a standard yet um, because the CMPC is not a standard, you know, where licensure and counselor and clinical is. So I think that is the biggest roadblock still is opportunities for people to get to do the work. Like I have a bachelor's degree in sports psych and there were no internships. I mean, mm -hmm. there was, there was really nothing that I could do without a master's. And there's just a very specific process towards CMPC that you have to go through. And mm -hmm. everyone who, who isn't, doesn't. Well, and I think even the field itself, not everyone is getting a CMPC. Um, I think more are now, which is great. With our accreditation program that we've had and the requirements for that, we've, we've really sold the need for that. And you can see professional organizations having that as a preferred requirement um, where they have to have this or they won't hire you. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to the licensure status where it has to be like mandated. There's too many judicial legislation systems that get involved in that. Um, the, the Achilles heel that gets us is anybody can say they do what we do at the mental skills level, right? Now, everyone can't say they're a clinical sports psych like me because I have a license, right? But but if we took you, you can go off and promote yourself and you actually have a degree in sports psych as an undergrad, right? So you have a base level knowledge, but you could go sell yourself as the next best mental skills coach that exists. And no one in the field could say you're wrong, you know, because we don't, we don't have that status. Now we could kind of try to sell all the ethical backgrounds and trainees and exist, but if you're really good at selling and you get the right clients, like we see it happen all the time. Yeah. It's really, <laughs> yeah, it is. And like, when I'm looking at, at bringing guests in, I always look for CMP certification because that way I know mm -hmm. that this person is Quite. like an actual, an actual practitioner. But every once in a while, there will be guests that kind of slip through the cracks because they are really good at marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's things like mental health counselor or like there are there yeah. are all of these little terminology that are really close, but yeah. there aren't official certification. And I think it detracts from the amazing work that people like you are doing. I think it's hard in the duly trained, and, and thank you, I appreciate that, <laughs> but I, I think it's it's hard in the um, duly trained individual or the mental health realm, mental illness realm for counselors or licensed psychologists. I know when I was 
getting my clinical degree and I've had mentors who are psychologists who are not CPC and they're amazing. They're still my mentors today. They do amazing work and they specialize. And we've had avid conversations about why are they not? And for them, they had already been an established practitioner in the career. Their license does trump the CMPC in terms of like regulations and sanctions. And it was the highest level of credibility and they didn't need to. And they asked me, why would I? And I said, because of where the field's going, where I'm at my marketing level, I do need to identify and distinguish myself different than other psychologists. And I believe in the field of mental skills training and the kinesiology and education, and I need to represent the brand. And so we had a very distinct dialogue of older practitioner professionals that are clinically trained that also have the knowledge of sport and are sport psychologists. Um, and APA distinguishes it similarly, but different, right? Of sports psychology and what, what specializes you in. Um, they had a very rational reason, but generationally and, and where we're at in the field, the CMPC is what distinguishes me from any other clinical psychologist. Uh, and I'm, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of my training. Like I used to have to battle, was I more kinesiology? Cause I have six years of training in that and two degrees around this. Right. And so like, what was I was, and I'm like, well, I'm both. And I can be both and both help me who I am. Um, but there are very great psychologists that are not CMPC. And I think it's just the timing and their, their expertise. And, you know, I think there's great CMPC master level, doctorate level trainers that are not psychologists that do amazing work as well, but you have to know your, your niche and you have to know your boundary of practice and like what you're selling. Yeah. Like when I, when I got my bachelor's degree, there were like a few different next paths, you know, like one of them was a master's in counseling. One of them was athletic training as a master's program. I mean, there were a lot of different things that you can do with sports psychology degrees that aren't getting you certified for Mm -hmm. work, but there is like a, I'm a former athlete and now I think I can work with other with current athletes on mental training that I don't really think is, I think it needs some work. Yeah. And they're going to get their brand because they were an elite athlete, right? Like, I mean, I get to speak of a ton and I will not discredit their credibility as an athlete, but, uh, and I love their platform for wanting to do great for mental health and mental illness um, and, and mindset coaching, but um, it does discredit or I guess like dilute the the actual qualifications of those of us that spent the time to do the work yeah which leads me into the TED talk that you did how yeah. did that come to be how did you decide what topic you were going to talk about and how were you received what was the feedback that's so cool yeah I appreciate that uh it was probably the boldest move I had made to speak my passion and truth to, to the public. Um, and, and, you know, and, and at that time I'd been five years licensed, um, and I had been working for 10 years as a mental skills coach where I had got my clinical degree in 2013 and like had developed my practice. So I'd been quote unquote, the 10 year rule of like, when you think you've made it as deliberate practice and, um, felt I had knowledge and I was, I was teaching at Texas state at the time. And, um, I had a colleague that was like, Hey, like, I think you should do this. And I was like, okay, like I'll, I'll figure it out. And then they're like, all right, yeah, we want you to do this. And here's your coach. And it was honestly my coach, John Alba, he's amazing. Um, he sat down with me for the process. And he's like, this is a story to tell. What story do you have? Write down all the ideas of what you think is cool, what you think is relevant. And it was a process that when I first signed up, I had no topic. I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, and I was just trying to define my niche and where I was at. And you know, we worked through this story and it was like, you know what, like I went through a pretty normal experience as an athlete that everyone goes through and no one talks about. And I've always had the vantage point of seeing where I think the future is going and knowing where the future will lead to. And mental illness was like on the trajectory of like where things were going to come. And we knew that that was going to be a bigger shift versus just performance optimization. And I was like, you know what, like i I have these conversations behind closed doors with professionals, with people like this is real, like this exists. Why aren't we doing anything about it? And I've always been told, like, if you're not going to do anything about it, then don't speak about it. And I'm like, well, then I'm going to speak about it. And um, and I went through it and it was probably at that point in my career, the coolest thing I had done. Um, and I'm so grateful. And I remember like being nervous, like when it was going to be released, but 
the universe was really nice to me. I was at a, a sports like um, APA or ASP um, conference that year. It was in Toronto in 2018. And we had this great speaker who actually was speaking to all the things that I was speaking about in my TED talk. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, I'm going to be just fine. Like people are really aware. Um, and yeah, for the majority, like I think everyone was like really grateful and proud. And I've gotten tons of speaking opportunities from coursework or students reaching out or people interested or athletes responding to me being like, Hey, I saw this Ted talk and like, I totally relate. And, um, I think it's been amazing. It's still to this day, you know, five years later, I'm getting people who've seen it and like it and speak to it. My niece, I think my coolest one was my niece this summer. She's um, 16 and she's taking like a college credit since she has a college student. They had to pick a TED talk that was inspiring to them. And she's like, Hey, one of my students like did your talk and like was talking about it. And I was like, Oh, that's so cool. So it was like very serendipitous, like close to home. Um, and it's now launched into, um, I'm, I'm building upon it. I wrote a book that will be released in September, um, that expands upon this. And my book's called, um, hello trauma, our invisible teammate. And it's kind of breaking it down even further and, and really experientially helping individuals know what trauma feels like, what it exists. And the second part is how organizations like sport are reinforcing it and need to make change. Wow. So that's that the second so thing we're doing my book. <laughs> which I'm like really excited about. No, drop all the plugs. <laughs> yeah, I'm like so excited about this book. It's like really cool. It's coming out in, in September. I think that may line up really well with when your episode is coming out. Um, Yay. Let me just check on that. I have incredible stories through like almost the end of October every week. And... Mm -hmm. Your episode is coming out on September 13th. Oh, nice. So that's right before my book. Oh my it's God. It's supposed yay. to drop September 25th. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's perfect. It's a little promo. Yeah. Little promo. Love that. Um, If you could just, once that, once the book is published, if you could just like direct message me or um, email me the link to it where we can all purchase, yeah. that would be amazing totally um, well. yeah I'd love, to, I'd love to promote it I love promoting individuals in this it's cool. that are doing awesome work I'll and show you the cover because I'm most like it's so cool my cover is like probably the coolest um, whoa so this is our invisible team that you can't see but you get the gist of it yeah oh my gosh so that's so cool I'm so excited for you yeah thank you is there anything else that you think that I missed talking about about your process about your your career trajectory about the general sports psych industry that you wanted to make clearer or known that we haven't talked about yet no I mean I think I think we've covered a lot of it I think it's um that this work is really a continuum right? The work is very continuum of, of where we work at it, where I specialize in is across that board, but much more mental health and athletes and, and trying to take a preventative approach, right? Where I'm trying to teach mental skills training as a preventative approach to reduce mental illness, right? So it's kind of two folds, but um, no, I think we covered a great realm of what I believe in and my passion and how we need to stop hurting our children. I, I'm so excited to put together your episode is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we go for today? Any no, topics that you wanted to expound on? Anything that just literally anything, the floor is yours. I always say at the end of the episode, if there's anything we talked about or didn't talk about that you want to, go on ahead. Uh, no, I think I think the the avenue of just like the work that we do, right? Um is it can't be individual. Like, you know, I think practitioners, the podcasts that we're doing, we really do have to band together. A lot of us are saying the same message. And, um, and I think there's a, I don't know what it is in the field where it feels like we have to individually just do our own stuff. And I'm always like, Hey, we're better together. We're more, we can share the same conversations and promote it. And like, then we can make it a standard. Right. And I think that that's my biggest push for everyone. Anyone interested in the field, anyone who's curious about it is like, 
reach out to people, have conversations, find the right people. Um, and they're going to know someone else who's going to be the right person. Like, uh, you know, I think like one person or the five top names that mark themselves the best, like they're not the only ones that do the work. So really just be curious and find someone and like ask questions and someone along the way will probably be able to help you. And I think that's the first step in any of this is just being curious and opening the, the idea to letting someone like myself or other practitioners in to help people. Yeah, I think that this industry is so small that you end up seeing kind of the same people mm -hmm. and like you're one degree of separation from incredible stories. And, and everyone's doing really help. cool work, right? Yeah. Everyone's doing really cool work in different ways and different approaches. And like, that's the thing is like, there's really great people out there who want to help. And it doesn't have to just be when you feel that you're emotionally or mentally broken or there's a problem, like it can be so much better. Um, and we can make mental health Help the same as physical health of like constant check-ins and work through that process. And that's what I try to push for is like, let's just reframe how we look at it and make resources available for people to utilize them. Love that. I think on that note, we are going to conclude yeah. for today. <laughs> Thanks for talking with me. 